Welcome to the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge's first ever virtual friends gathering. This is the last in our series of presentations for the week. And this afternoon's presentation is Basic Shorebird Identification with Ken Kaufman. Okay, just a little bit of housekeeping. This program is going to be recorded and will be posted after it's been formatted to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So if you're in, in, uncomfortable at all with your video feed inadvertently being recorded, please find the recording icon in the Zoom toolbar and click your video off. Okay, so welcome. This Presentation is one of many that has been a part of our virtual gathering all week long. I am Janelle Wicks. I'm the executive director for the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, and I'm really proud of what we've been able to do here this week. Thank you for being a part of it. The Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge's mission is to promote the conservation and appreciation of cultural and natural resources on the refuge. And we do that through stewardship, advocacy and outreach and this virtual friends gathering has been an amazing opportunity to do outreach and education to our friends and followers no matter where you are so thank you for being a part of it this afternoon we have ken kaufman as part of our program ken is a freelance writer an artist and a naturalist most of his energy is currently going into his book projects and painting bird portraits he has written a dozen books, including his own series of field guides, a set of which will be available for auction tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m., and his most recent title, A Season on the Wind. We're grateful to our friend, for his uh, Ken, for his service as a Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge board member and an advocate for the National Wildlife Refuge system. Before I turn things over to Ken, I want to remind everyone to please keep yourselves on mute. This will minimize the background noise during the presentation. Um, I will be moderating the chat box, so if you have questions, please type them there, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for a QA. and a All right, without further ado, Ken Kaufman. Okay, well, thanks very much, Janelle. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Well, I was about to say here, but here is in my living room in Ohio. But um, anyway, I uh, was just happy to be taking part in this uh, virtual friends gathering. Um, I love the uh, National Wildlife Refuge system in general, and I love Malheur. It's, uh, it's, it's such an amazing place and holds such a special place in the, uh, the history of bird conservation uh, in North America. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to support it. And uh, I... Uh, uh, for this, uh, since I'm so far away and I didn't want to have to rely on the um, internet connection from here, um, I sent the PowerPoint to Janelle, so she's going to be uh, uh, advancing the slides. So every couple of, every few seconds, I'll be saying, next slide, please. And um, sorry about the, the interruption, but we'll, we'll get through it as smoothly as we can. And hopefully that way the pictures will come through clearly. So yeah, um, shorebirds. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, I love shorebirds. Um, greater yellow legs here. Um, but when we um, when we talk about shorebirds, it's it's good to start off by defining exactly what the group is that we're um, that we're talking about. Um, next slide, please. Um, I know that. Um, you know, when I, when I use the term in sort of a general way, uh, talking to members of the public, they assume that it includes any kind of bird that's found on the shore, uh, like a great blue heron or a penguin or whatever else. Um, but with, um, with birders, it's actually got a very uh, specific definition. Uh, in North America, when we talk about shorebirds, uh, the crazed bird people are talking about uh, just members of a few specific families of birds, the plovers and sandpipers and a few other families that are closely related to them. Uh, next slide, please. And um, shorebirds, uh, shorebirds are not necessarily on the shore. That's another thing that's tricky about them. Um, members of the 
uh, plover and sandpiper families in particular may be far away from any kind of shoreline. This upland sand Sorry, I was just muted there. Um, <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, upland sandpiper is a, is a very rare bird in the Pacific states. It's mostly found on the Great Plains, but um, it's it lives out in wide open prairies, uh, grasslands, and migrates to grasslands of South America. And if it ever lands on a shore, it's purely by accident. So. There are also some plovers like killdeer and mountain plover that are usually far away from the water. So, uh, so shorebirds, uh, we're just talking about this one uh, particular uh, taxonomic group. Uh, next, please. And so, um, this, you know, beginning birders often um, develop a dislike for the shorebirds because these birds, they're really, a lot of them are really similar. They're really subtle and each species is really variable so they can be hard to identify. I know when I was getting started with birds as a kid I, I hated these birds. I'd, I'd go out to a place where I could peer off at this distant pond and uh, just say well I wonder what that one is and I, I really didn't like them at all but uh, they've become one of my favorite groups of birds now just because um, you know once you get to the point where you where they make sense to you and you can figure them out they're just so um, uh, so amazing. So, um, so yeah, they're, they're among my, my favorite birds now. And um, let's see, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, they're, most of them are not really, really brightly colored. They're, most of them are shades of brown and um, gray and white and black. Um, but with that, even without bright colors, uh, they've got just really wonderful, elegant designs. Uh, they're, a lot of them are designed for, for long distance flight. And uh, so they, they, it really shows. They're graceful, sleek birds. And some of them migrate from one end of the Americas to the other. And to me, that's just inspiring. So, uh, so I really love these birds. Uh, next, please. So, uh, it can be really uh, spectacular if you go someplace where you can see big uh, concentrations of shorebirds. And sometimes, you know, there are places, uh, sometimes the water conditions are just right on the refuge or on estuaries out on the coast. You can see thousands of shorebirds. Uh, and that's great to see. But for study, uh, for learning the identification, it's, uh, it's ideal to find a situation where you can get really close to a few birds and, and look at all their details. Next, please. So size, um, there's a lot of size variation among the, the shorebirds and uh, direct comparisons of size uh, frequently are, are possible and they're really useful when you, can, uh, when you can get birds side by side and say, okay, well, that one's bigger than that one. Um, it really helps to get things sorted out. I mean, just looking at the uh, at this picture, you might say, "Oh, well, there's a sandpiper with its baby," but it's it's actually two different species, uh, Dunlin and Lee sandpiper, uh, both in winter plumage, uh, and they just happen to be side by side, and you can really see the striking size difference there. Uh, next, please. And it's it's really helpful um, if you can. Um, calibrate some bird of known identity. Uh, if you go to some um, some spot where there are a number of shorebirds present, it looks like there are different kinds there. Uh, rather than focusing first on the ones you don't recognize, if you can find one, you know for sure that, okay, that's a killdeer or that's a ruddy turnstone or something. Start with that and then work from that out to the ones you're not sure about. Like, um, uh, Curlew sandpiper is a really rare visitor in North America and it's uh, sort of reddish brown. There are some other sandpipers and shorebirds that are that have reddish brown colors but uh, the curly sandpiper is the one that's really close in size to the Dunlin. So if you've got them side by side it makes it much easier to be sure that uh, that's the one you've got. 
Uh, let's see. Next, please. Um, now, the, um, the, the flocking behavior, the social behavior is really a good clue, uh, especially when you're seeing birds way out at a distance. So uh, here in the upper picture, there's a distant flock of, of long-billed dowagers, and they're, they're standing around. Some of them are asleep. They've got their bills tucked in uh, behind their scapular feathers, but they're, um, they're, they're all like the same size. They're standing really close together, and uh, that's that's a really really characteristic thing for for long billed dowagers and the the solitary sandpiper down below you'll notice it's all by itself um, that could indicate that it knows how to read and uh, knows that it's uh, supposed to be solitary but it's they do tend to be um, loners uh, even if you're at a spot if there are several solitary sandpipers around if they're disturbed they'll fly off separately instead of flying off as a flock and you know, you got these these different variations. Uh, you know, with within the shorebirds, you go from some that form really tight flocks, like uh, sanderlings and dunlins and others that tend to be more dispersed. But that's uh, that's a useful field mark. Let's see, uh, next please. And and habitat is worth looking at. Um, frequently, of course, you'll find a lot of a lot of different species of shorebirds in exactly the same spot in mud right along the edge of the water, but they have different preferences. And so sometimes with, with birds like long-billed curlew or marbled godwit, uh, you'll find them out in just open fields and quite some distance away from the water. And you occasionally see that with birds like uh, pectoral and baird sandpipers as well. And then at the, at the water's edge, there are some that will be actually out in the water waiting around and some that usually stay up on the shore. Uh, so that's um, that's a useful kind of thing to focus on as well. Let's see, uh, next please. Now feeding behavior is a, a really key point. Um, ruddy turnstone, that's a pretty rare bird inland. You can see a lot of them uh, over along the coast, but they're, they're named because they actually do go walking along. This, here's this, this chunky little, it's a, it's a member of the sandpiper family, but it goes, walking along on the stocky orange legs and takes that wedge-shaped bill and puts uh, the bill underneath a rock and, and flips it over. It, you know, it actually turns stones. And that, uh, you know, there's two species of turn stones, but that behavior uh, you're not going to see from, from other shorebirds. Uh, next, please. And, you know, feeding behavior, there's some that are, they move very slowly and stolidly and some that move around a lot. Wilson's phalarope, a lot of the time if you see a phalarope, it's going to be swimming because uh, the three species of phalaropes are the only uh, shorebirds that regularly swim uh, and they'll swim and they'll turn in circles and, you know, that way you can immediately rule out other things. But when Wilson's phalarope is out running around on shore, it frequently is like actively running. It's like it, it sees some insect uh, you know, 20 yards away and goes dashing after it. And that's, uh, you're not going to see that, uh, that kind of behavior from most kinds of shorebirds. So, so again, feeding behavior is really useful. Uh, next, please. And uh, I actually, I used the same slide, I think, the other day talking about general principles of identification. But um, Identifying shorebirds, it's mostly a matter of their, their shape and, and structure. Uh, here we've, there's a silhouette of a lesser yellow legs above and silhouette of a pectoral sandpiper below. And if you study it, you can see a lot of differences between those birds uh, just in their shapes. Uh, even though in terms of color patterns, they're very similar, uh, the shape is different. And so um, uh, it's when you've got a situation where you've recognized some some kind of shorebird by all its markings, it's worthwhile to take an extra minute and just sort of, okay, now if I couldn't see any markings or color, you know, what shape would I see? What shape and structure uh, and behavior would I see on this bird that would make it distinctive? Uh, let's see, next please. And when you're looking at the, at the shapes of these birds, uh, the bill shape um, is obviously, important in identification and it also has a, a big impact uh, on the, the feeding behavior of each kind. 
Uh, here's a uh, semi-palmated plover uh, above and a long-billed doucher below. And, uh, you know, even if, even if we just looked at bill shape, you know, we would never confuse these two. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the bill shape also uh, lends itself to their feeding behavior. The, uh, the really, really short-billed birds like the plover, when they're feeding, they're, they're doing it visually. And you'll, so you'll see, you'll see a plover run a few steps and then pause and look around and peck at something on the ground. And the downchers, um, when, the, when the bird is really long-billed like that, uh, it's likely to do a lot of its feeding uh, by touch, just by probing down into the mud. And in fact, you'll see flocks of downchers standing around in the water and they've got their, their their heads buried practically up to their eyes and they're just probing straight down into the mud um, looking for stuff down there just feeling not looking they're they're feeling for some kind of little prey down there those you know little worms and things that were up in the front of the biology book when you were in high school those primitive life forms um, I used to wonder I think okay well, well what then if, um, if a doucher is probing way down into deep sticky mud and it touches something down there oh what is it going to do about it uh, but it turns out their their bills are actually flexible at the tip uh, next please Let's see so here um <laughs> here's a long bill downcher showing off this ability it's got and if you look uh, at the tip of the upper mandible of the bill it's actually curved upwards uh, they can keep the bill closed and open just the tip, which is a great trick, you know, if you're if you're probing into uh, deep mud like that. So they can actually open up the tip of the bill and grab something and then pull it up and and swallow it. Uh, so uh, that that doesn't necessarily help you identify the bird, but it's just a cool thing to know about it. Uh, next, please. Uh, one thing about looking at the the shapes of of these birds is that their shape can seem to change uh, by the moment. Um, like this, the stilt sandpiper, which again is a, a rare bird in the Pacific states, um, it's they don't always they're not always in that posture. Uh, but the so for learning learning the shapes of these shorebirds, the best way to learn is just to spend more time uh, watching them um, as they move around and uh, get accustomed to what they look like from different angles. Uh, next, please. Now, um, part of the reason I, you know, I have to blame it on somebody else, but part of the reason I had trouble with shorebirds uh, as a kid was that the the books I was using, they focused on uh, starting with, with leg color to tell these things apart. But the problem is um, you often, uh, you often can't use that. The, the upper bird here is a least sandpiper. And it's described in the books as having yellow legs, but that's frequently hard to see. You know, just a little bit of silhouette of backlighting or some mud uh, on the legs, you can't really see that the legs are yellow. Uh, the birds down below are lesser yellow legs, and their <laughs> their legs are so lesser at this point that you can't even see them because they're wading practically up to their bellies, and so uh, leg color is totally invisible. So, you know, if you can see it. Uh, it's always worthwhile to take a look at, at leg color, but it's uh, it's not necessarily a good place to start. Uh, let's see. Uh, next, please. Um, okay. Um, now, one problem with with shorebird identification is that a lot of the species, or the great majority of them, show uh, seasonal variations in what they look like. There, there are some exceptions. Uh, the killdeer, which is one of the most common of the shorebirds, actually looks pretty much the same uh, all year round. Uh, but it's the exception, and most of them uh, change quite a bit with the seasons. Uh, this, for example, is, uh, these are dunlins. Uh, the upper bird in, in breeding plumage, it's got reddish brown on the back. Uh, the chest is sort of streaked with white and black, and then the belly has a big black patch. Uh, down below, there's a dunlin in winter plumage, and it's mostly just gray on the back and head and chest uh, with a white belly. 
Oh, it actually the the name Dunlin was was applied to it first by the British. Uh, they they see Dunlins mostly in winter, and Dun means it's like a a grayish brown color. So it was named for that uh, that sort of winter color. At one time in North America, we called it red-backed sandpiper in honor of what it looked like in breeding plumage. But with international standardization, the Dunlin has become the name now. Um, so let's see, next slide, please. So with the, uh, with a lot of the, um, a lot of the shorebirds, there are three distinct uh, plumages that they occur in. And sandwing is a really good example. It's, it's pretty uncommon at the refuge, so it's, it's not something you see there regularly, but it's, it's very common uh, all along the coast um, for most of the year, actually. So with these, uh, these three illustrations, the one on the left is an adult in winter plumage. They look really pale. Um, they, they look sort of like, like dry sand in terms of overall color. Um, and that's, um, the adults are going to be in this, this so-called winter plumage for most of the year, at least from like, you know, from September to March or April. Uh, in the center is an adult in full breeding plumage, and it's a much more colorful bird, very reddish brown around the head, a lot of reddish brown marking on the back, but they, uh, they're in that breeding plumage for a very short time. They'll, they'll be molting into it still, like in May when they're migrating north, and in July when they start to migrate south, they're already molting out of breeding plumage. So um, you really have to work at it to see that that bright uh, breeding plumage in the lower 48. And then um, the bird on the right is a sanderling in juvenile plumage. So this is, the, um, this is the plumage that it wears when it migrates south from the tundra for the first time. Now these birds, even though you can find them most of the year all along the coast here, um, they migrate up to the high Arctic for breeding. And then when they leave there in late summer and come back south, these juveniles, the birds that are just hatched this year, uh, the back is going to be spangled with the, these feather centers are black and they have big silvery spots. Uh, they look very neat, neatly patterned, but they'll just look that way for the first, you know, two or three months of their life and then they never have that, uh, that pattern again. So, with most of the shorebirds, you can see these three distinct plumages. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, that, that means that there are more different uh, patterns for us to memorize. Um, next, please. Okay, so, um, uh, so here's a uh, Western sandpiper in September and it's juvenile plumage. And, these, the juveniles are often uh, among the most distinctively patterned of the birds. And, uh, you know, up until the 1980s, uh, the juvenile plumages of these, these birds weren't even illustrated in field guides. So uh, I can say, you know, in my own defense for all the trouble I had as a kid, I could say that back then these birds weren't even illustrated uh, in the books. And now they're now, um, essentially, all the field guides show the juvenile plumages too, and well, they they tend to be with most of the uh, sandpipers in particular. They have this really striking pattern where there will be dark centers of the feathers and pale edges, so they look scalloped and just really a bright, uh, crisp uh, kind of pattern, and they they really look beautiful. And it's um, this is a good time of year. If you go out in August and September, you can see a lot of these birds in their juvenile plumage, and it's uh, it's one of the great uh, benefits or rewards of, of going to look for them uh, right now at this season. Uh, next, please. Uh, so, for example, um, here's a couple of semi-palmated sandpipers uh, in August, and um, you, you got a few semis uh, coming through. Uh, the refuge and, and elsewhere in the Pacific states. Um, so up above there's an adult and it's in sort of the fading remains of breeding plumage and starting to look sort of ratty. Uh, if you if you look at the back there you can see there's there's patches of uh, gray-brown and there's patches of black and they have this sort of disheveled appearance. 
And down below, there's a juvenile. I was just uh, at that stage, just a couple of months old. All those feathers are really fresh and crisp. They have dark centers and pale edges. And so uh, often at this time of year, you can look at uh, one of these birds and it's easier to tell whether it's an adult or a juvenile than it is to tell what species it is. And that, that might seem sort of odd or backwards, but it's, it's something that's, uh, that happens at this season. And it uh, yeah, just makes it really interesting. Uh, next, please. Now it's, um, it's, 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 it's challenging at times to see the, the flight patterns of, of birds in general, uh, but often uh, uh, so, some species are easier to pick out uh, in flight than they are when they're at rest. Uh, the willet is the classic example, uh, especially willets in winter plumage like the one up above is just completely gray-brown, just looks like the solid citizen with you know, nothing to recommend it, but when the willet flies, it flashes this big black and white wing pattern and suddenly becomes uh, easier to recognize. So it's, it's worth taking the effort to watch these things. Uh, and if, you, if you're watching some sandpiper or plover and you know what it is and then it takes off and flies, it's, it's worth taking the effort to try to follow it in binoculars and see what it looks like as it flies uh, so you'll have a better chance of recognizing it next time. Uh, next, please. And the voices um, of, of shorebirds are also useful. They're, um, you know, often they're um, like here's a uh, here's a lesser yellow legs flying around, and it's got its bill slightly open. It's calling. Um, often, uh, if you're at a place where there are a lot of birds around, you'll notice um, some of the uncommon species first uh, by hearing them call. Uh, as they fly or from hearing them call someplace out on the flats. And for a few things, uh, dowagers and, and yellow legs, uh, the, uh, uh, the voices can be among the, the best ways to identify the different species. Okay, uh, next please. Okay, now Harney County, uh, more than 30 species of the true shorebirds have been found uh, in Harney County. So they're you know, they're, they're possible on the refuge anytime you go there. And this, uh, that diversity becomes more manageable if we break these all down uh, into groups. Uh, so I'm gonna, going to do that next. Uh, next slide, please. Now, fortunately, some of them are easy. Um, Black-necked stilt and American avocet, not only, uh, they, they form a different family. They're related to the sandpipers, but they're, they're classified in a different family and they're uh, they're easy to identify and they're gorgeous birds and they're fairly common and so those are those are crowd pleasers among the among the shorebirds uh, but because they're distinctive i'm not going to talk about them very much uh, and i'm also not going to talk about the oyster catchers very much since they're pretty easy to identify and they're strictly out on the coast uh, next please uh, but plovers um, they're, they're worth some, some attention. The, uh, the killdeer is a good example. It's our most familiar plover and um, the semi-palmated plover down below. These are, the plovers in general have short bills, very short bills. They, um, they forage visually. They'll, they tend to like run or walk a few steps and then stop and then pick things up off the ground. Uh, they almost never probe into anything. They're just, uh, picking things up, they tend to have fairly large eyes. Um, and that you can see that like on that lower, that semi-palmated plover, it has kind of a big eyed look for its size that that makes them look kind of cute actually. And then the cuteness of the face is, uh, is a field mark sometimes. Um, and then, um, so there are a number of um, plovers that have this pattern of having uh, they're brown above, white below, and they've got neck rings. Uh, snowy plover is another example. Um, let's see, uh, next slide, please. And then the uh, black belly plover and golden plover are bigger, stockier plovers that have black on the underparts and a spangled pattern on the upper parts in breeding plumage, and they look uh, much plainer uh, in juvenile and winter plumages. And uh, I'm not going to go into much detail about those uh, because the, the sandpipers are where the real uh, challenges are. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, so most of the shorebirds that we see are members of the sandpiper family, and they're they're very diverse. It helps to uh, break these down into subgroups. And here, you know, one of these is a least sandpiper, and one is a long-billed curlew. And it doesn't take um, doesn't take a lot of careful thought to figure out uh, which one is which. Um, if they're appropriately named. The, the long-billed curlew is, is the lower one, and it, it does have a long bill. It's, it's the largest of the shorebirds uh, in North America. Um, the, um, I'm not going to go into detail about the curlews and godwits. Long-billed curlew and marbled godwit are interesting because they both have, they've got pretty similar patterns. Uh, they're not real close relatives, but they have similar uh, color patterns and often they're in similar habitats, being grasslands in the breeding season and frequently going out to uh, mud flats or to the coast uh, when, the, when they're not breeding. Um, but they're, they're really big shorebirds. They're, it's easy to see the bill shapes and details. And so we'll, we'll go on from those to others that are a little more challenging. Uh, next, please. So the willet, um, willets are, they can be very, <coughs> excuse me, very common uh, at the refuge uh, in the warmer months of the year. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the largest uh, sandpipers um, that we see regularly. And um, let's see, I temporarily lost the picture there, but, um, so yeah, the, um, uh, the, the picture in the upper left is a willet in its breeding plumage. It's got, at that stage, it's browner. It has lots of black barring on it. Uh, the two pictures on the right are willets in winter plumage. Uh, and then the lower left is willet in flight. Um, they can be really confusing and mysterious when they're standing around. And that's when it really pays to study their shapes. They're just big, stocky, heavy-bodied birds. Uh, they don't have the upcurved bill of a godwit. The bill is very stocky. Um, but then, you know, eventually if you watch, they'll fly and you'll see that wing pattern and they become easy to identify. Uh, let's see, next slide, please. So aside from the willet, the, the birds that are classified in the genus Tringa are mostly slender and graceful and they do a lot of wading around. Uh, lesser yellow eggs here, for example. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the, the classic problems is telling the greater yellow legs and lesser yellow legs apart. Um, their, their legs are pretty similar. <laughs> and they have uh, pretty much the same kind of seasonal variation uh, in, in plumage. Uh, there's, there's greater yellow legs above and lesser yellow legs below. The, the size difference between them isn't uh, isn't always that helpful. You can see it if they're side by side, but it's not really strikingly obvious. And it's really hard to see the size difference if they're, if they're not uh, side by side. Uh, next, please. So for example, here's a picture. Uh, this is uh, three yellow legs standing on a muskrat mound. And the, the one on the lower left is a lesser yellow legs. And the other two are greater yellow legs. And you can see, um, you know, one thing they have in common is they all have just one leg. Um, nothing greater about that. But they're, no, they're, <laughs> they frequently rest uh, just standing on one leg and pull up the other one. Um, and, um, you know, you can see here with, with them all being at the same plane, the same distance from us, and fairly close together, you can see the lesser yellow legs is, is smaller. And it's great when we have that situation. But um, it isn't easy to find them that way. Uh, next, please. So this is a drawing to, uh, to sort of focus on the head shape and bill shape. And that, um, I, I have to say, when I was learning these birds, I would have to relearn the yellow legs year after year. And it was sort of embarrassing. So, you know, I've, I've seen these before. Um, but just going out and practicing with them, so looking at them again every year, um, eventually they start to make more sense. But the, uh, the bill on the lesser yellow legs 
Um, if you were to reverse it, uh, which wouldn't be a nice thing to do to the bird, uh, if you were to reverse it and turn it backwards, it would barely go past the back of the head. The bill is very straight. It's not very thick at the base and it looks mostly black. Where the, the bill on the greater yellow legs, uh, if you were to reverse it, it would go way past the back of the head. It's almost twice the, uh, the head length. Uh, it's much thicker at the base and it often looks a little bit paler there. And there's just a hint of an up curve to, to the bill. So a really good study of the bill shape really uh, can help you to tell these apart. Uh, next, please. Now the solitary sandpiper up above, it's in the same genus, uh, uh, the same genus Tringa, and it looks kind of like a scaled down lesser yellow legs with, with greenish legs. It's darker, it's got more of an eye ring, but it's more often confused with the spotted sandpiper uh, because those are similar in size and they both do sort of this bobbing behavior. Uh, with the with the solitary sandpiper, it's bobbing its head and four parts. And with the spotted sandpiper, it's bobbing its tail and its rear parts up and down. And so if you watch long enough, you can see that it's a different, uh, you know, the, the focus of that motion is different. But at first glance, it's, it's not necessarily uh, obvious. So, you know, frequently, you know, you see something that's either a spotted sandpiper or solitary sandpiper, you have to take a second look to tell them apart. Uh, next, please. Okay, here's a couple of pictures of spotted sandpipers. In breeding plumage where they have lots of black spots underneath, they're pretty easy. Um, the bird on the upper left there has got just a few starting to come in. Uh, the one below is a juvenile and it doesn't, uh, doesn't show any of that spotting. With these, um, so much of it is just their uh, their shape and their behavior, and they they're solitary birds too. Even when there are a lot of them around, they don't form flocks. They're it's sort of every sandpiper for himself, and they'll they'll bob their tails as they walk around. Sometimes they'll they'll dash around after things, after insects or or crabs. But you know, behavior and shape are uh, they they're they're really distinctive uh, with enough time studying them. Uh, let's see. Next, please. Now, this this upper bird there is that's Wilson snipe, and the snipes are long-billed birds that go probing around in the mud. Uh, the dowagers are too, but the similarity pretty much ends there. Um, snipes, uh, you tend to find them in marshes. They tend to be solitary. They've got a really strong pattern, so they're really not uh, hard to identify. Uh, next, please. Uh, Dowagers, uh, again, here's a long-billed dowager in winter plumage. It's well-named. Um, they're, they're pretty plain in winter plumage. They've got nice, rich colors in breeding plumage, and they're pretty well-marked uh, in juvenile plumage as well. Um, winter plumages can be, it can be tough to tell the uh, long-billed and short-billed dowagers apart because the short-billed dowager has a long bill too. It's just not quite as long. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, for example, uh, in this uh, picture, the upper right bird is a long-billed dowager, and the rest are short-billed dowagers. And um, I'm, I'm not going to go any, into any detail about these. Um, I had to make choices about what to include um, just in order to get this all into the, uh, uh, the time that we had. Um, but it's really, you're most of the way there if you can recognize a bird as a dowager, as this really stocky bird with a short neck and long bill, stands around pretty stationary, probing straight down into the mud. It's just really characteristic uh, behavior. And then for telling the species apart, the call notes are good at all times of year. Um, breeding plumages are distinctive if you get a good look. Juvenile plumages are distinctive too, and it's just the, the adults in winter plumage that are extremely similar where you almost have to rely on the voices to tell them apart. Uh, let's see, next please. Now stilt sandpiper, this is a rare visitor and something that's worth looking for there. And I think it's, it's frequently overlooked because uh, 
it's related to the peeps, to the really small sandpipers, but um, in its its behavior and shape and its uh, um, and, and overall character, it suggests a cross between a yellow legs and a dowager. It's sort of shaped like a yellow legs, but it tends to feed like a dowager, probing by, you know, straight down into the mud with that long bill. Um, it's got a droop to the tip of the bill, which is different from either a yellow legs or a dowager. Um, but this, it's always worth watching for. It's, I don't actually, I don't know if there are any uh, Harney County records for it. Um, it. It's rare throughout the Pacific states, but, you know, just one of those exciting things, if you find one, um, all your friends will want to know about it. But just think of it as being like halfway between a yellow legs and a dowager. Let's see, uh, next please. Um, okay, the, the genus Calidris, I'm going to finish with these. These are the peeps or the stints as the British call them. And they're potentially the, uh, the most challenging uh, of the shorebirds for identification. Um, but they can also be fun and worth, worth getting to know. Uh, next slide, please. Now the sanderling, now this is a sandpiper that actually occurs on sand. Um, most of them don't. You know, most, most sandpipers prefer to be on mud or even out on grassy spots and they don't really like sand, sandy beaches that much. But sanderlings, uh, for most of the year, they're on sandy beaches out on the coast and they're the birds that go running down the shore chasing the waves and then turn around and run back as the waves are coming in. And you can identify them just on that alone if you see them. But small numbers come through the interior. And uh, when you see them there, it's more a matter of, you're looking at a, a small sandpiper, but very chunky bodied, very black legs, uh, stout, straight, black bill. Um, and if it flies, it's got a big white wing stripe uh, that, that's really conspicuous. Uh, let's see, next please. Now Dunlin, I talked about Dunlin earlier. Um, if we get a good look, it's, it's not too challenging because it's, it's pretty small. It's one of these small peep type sandpipers, but it's got a really heavy bill. The bill is thick at the base and droops at the tip. Um, and it's got that really strong pattern in the breeding plumage, which is the upper shot there and very gray on the back and chest and head um, in, in its winter plumage. Uh, next, please. Um, here are some, uh, some Dunlins in early spring that are just starting to molt into the uh, breeding plumage. Uh, timing can be helpful too, because this tends to be um, an early spring migrant. Um, uh, well, it, it varies. <laughs> you can see them practically any time during the spring migration, but uh, often they'll show up in numbers before some of the other species. Uh, and it tends to be a late fall migrant with some of them sticking around uh, you know, as late as there is open water. Uh, next, please. Uh, pectoral sandpiper is the largest of the peeps that we see. And again, this is, um, uh, you're more likely to see them in fall, but the, uh, uh, they tend to be an early spring migrant and they have a really long drawn out, drawn out fall migration. So some are already coming through now, but they, uh, there may still be some coming through uh, in October. Um, and this is, uh, it's very brown above, uh, white below, very striped looking, and there's always a very sharp cutoff between brown and white across the chest, more so than you see on any of these other uh, small sandpipers. Uh, let's see, next please. Uh, the one, the, the bird that may be most similar to it is Baird Sandpiper. And this is actually one of my favorite birds. Uh, Baird Sandpipers, they, they nest in the high Arctic, you know, way above the Arctic Circle. They winter all the way down to the very southern tip of South America. They have really long wings. They're, they're very graceful birds, very graceful flyers. Uh, these are both juveniles. And most of the Baird sandpipers that you'll get going through, like the area of the refuge, um, are going to be juveniles. And they'll be uh, probably peaking like late August, September. And uh, you can see really 
beautiful scalloped pattern here on the back and wings, uh, but very long wingtips as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's an example. This is a side view of a Baird sandpiper, and and looking back there um, toward the toward the back end of the bird, uh, the tail is down there below the wingtips, and then the wingtips extend way past uh, more than on any of the other small sandpipers that you're likely to see, and it it takes some practice to see this, but um, with practice, even without being able to see exactly where the tail is, um, that very long uh, swept back look of the wingtips is distinctive. Um, beautiful bird. Uh, let's see, next please. So most of the, uh, the really challenging peeps here are, are the smallest ones, either least sandpiper like the bird above or western sandpiper like the one below. And these, um, Often in books, the, um, the focus will be on the leg color of these. And it's true that if you have perfect lighting and the birds don't have mud uh, on their legs or something, the least sandpiper does have yellowish or greenish legs and they tend to be blackish on the Western sandpiper. For me, I can't see the difference, uh, that, that leg color difference in these photos. Um, but Western sandpiper is slightly larger, has a different bill shape, has a different overall color. Um, next, please. So here are a couple of um, adult least sandpipers. And um, actually, you can see yellow legs here. But especially if you look at the upper photo there and look at that bill, um, the bill is, is not very long. It's, it's much shorter than the length of the head. And it comes to a very fine tip that seems to be almost like crinked down a little bit. Uh, right at the tip. Um, the bird has a fairly small head. Um, the the upper bird there is a, it's a leaf sandpiper and sort of faded breeding plumage. It's kind of blotchy on the back. Uh, the one on the lower left there is a leaf sandpiper in winter plumage. It looks a little bit plainer, um, but very brown. The overall look is it's closer to brown than it is to gray. Um, uh, no matter how drab they might look in winter plumage, they're, they're at least brownish uh, shade of gray. Uh, next, please. Now, these are these sandpipers in juvenile plumage. Uh, and even, you know, it's the way we see them off at a distance with the grass on the way and so on. And even, you know, at a glance, you can see this is a much more brightly colored bird. It's bright, uh, almost reddish brown uh, on the cap and on the wings. Uh, on the back, um, there's uh, the really dark, uh, neat uh, feather patterns there, uh, dark centers of the feathers and pale edges, and um, the overall the overall appearance, the overall color is is a is a much browner looking bird. Uh, let's see, next please. Now here, uh, these are western sandpipers in in adult plumage, and the overall um, the overall color here, especially if you look at the upper bird where you can, that's, that's a side view, it's a grayer looking bird. The, the overall color of the back and the head is grayer. The chest uh, tends to be whiter. The bill is heavier at the base. It's heavier and it, it's also got a droop, but it tends to look, it's a longer bill. Um, Western sandpiper has a bigger head than leaf sandpiper. Um, these, you know, um, I, I apologize if it seems like I'm talking about shape differences that are hard to see, but if you, if you study um, like photographs of these and, you know, make sure they're correctly identified, don't look them up on, you know, don't Google pictures online because half of them are identified wrong. But if you look at, look at photos that are correctly identified and compare um, just back and forth from least sandpiper to western sandpiper, you'll see these differences in shape, uh, the shape of the bill, the, the overall uh, tone of gray versus brown on the birds. Um, these are all adults. The, the one that's uh, facing left in the, the upper picture is pretty much in winter plumage and the other two are, uh, are molting into breeding plumage. Once they're in full breeding plumage, they're very colorful birds. And 
Um, I actually don't have a picture of that here, but they're, they're good illustrations in all the field guides. Uh, let's see, next please. And these are, these are Western sandpipers in juvenile plumage. And compared to the juvenile least sandpipers we looked at earlier, the overall tone here is grayer. Uh, it's a grayer bird, except that on the scapulars, which are the, the feathers right above the wings, um, the, the, um, there's a rusty area in there. Those feather edges, um, they're like a reddish brown uh, just on the scapulars and it forms a contrasting line uh, compared to the more grayish overall look. And that's something that you just, uh, uh, you never get that uh, on least sandpipers. They're, um, they'll have a lot of reddish brown uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the plumage on the upper parts. And uh, uh, so the, uh, that, that overall uh, color difference um, is, is really distinctive. Um, just, uh, and, and again, you know, we, we go past these pictures pretty quickly and it, it, may, not, uh, it may not stick, but uh, study the illustrations. And that, that's, I, I always recommend looking for that first, looking for, you know, instead of looking for the leg color on these birds, uh, looking for the overall shape, um, looking for the um, looking for the the difference between overall brown versus overall gray uh, for telling uh, western and least sandpipers apart. Uh, next, please. Now, of course, the complicating thing there there's always a complication. Semi palmated sandpiper is a close relative of Western Sandpiper, and it also comes through in, in small numbers. It's a pretty rare bird um, in the Pacific States, but some come through every year. And um, if you're lucky and you find one, it will be a juvenile. Uh, this is a really fresh juvenile semi-palmated Sandpiper here. The, uh, the way they look uh, in uh, right at the end of August and beginning of September. And on this bird, uh, it doesn't have that warm uh, chestnut brown or reddish brown of a least sandpiper. And um, it's closer to the gray of a western sandpiper, but without the reddish brown on the scapulars. And it's got a little bit more of a buffy tone to it um, overall. So um, it's going to remind you very much of a western sandpiper. Um, but without the, the chestnut or rusty on the scapulars. Uh, tends to be shorter build on average than Western Sandpiper, um, but there's, there's overlap, so you can't uh, totally rely on, on bill shape. So, uh, let's see, next slide, please. Um, so that's... Um, that's a, just a very rapid uh, dash through uh, an overview of some of the shorebirds and, and ways to tell them apart. And um, I hope that some of that is, is useful. I think the sort of the, the general uh, principles that I talked about earlier in the talk might be more helpful um, than the specific field marks uh, for really making sense of these. But um, if you you know, this is a, a good thing to do for a rainy day activity. Uh, the next time you've got some spare time is uh, just go look at, uh, look at good illustrations, look at photographs, and think about some of these uh, marks that I talked about and how they compare on, on some of these different birds. Uh, shorebirds are, you know, like I said earlier, I, I really hated them when I was a kid. I'm just getting started. Um, and I've reached the point now where I, I really love the shorebirds. They're, They've got these intricate, delicate patterns of color. They do these incredible long migrations, and I feel like they really add a lot to the magic of birding. And Mount Here Refuge is a place that provides stopover habitat and breeding habitat for these birds. Uh, so uh, it's, it's one of the many reasons that I appreciate the refuge. So um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would. Uh, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's if there's anything left to say. 
All right, thank you, Ken, that was great. We did have a question, um, and please, if you have questions, go ahead and find that chat box and type them in there now. Um, someone is wondering um, how a ruddy turnstone and a sanderling really, like what are those distinguishing characteristics? Because they looked fairly similar in a series of, in a set of pictures that you showed at one point. Okay, yeah, that's that's a good point. And you find sanderlings and ruddy turnstones together a lot of the time. So it's, uh, that, that's a, uh, a good thing to think about. Um, a couple of, uh, a couple of differences, the, they tend to move differently. Um, um, the ruddy turnstone like almost waddles along. It's got really thick orange legs and the, uh, the sanderling has black legs. I know I told you not to look at leg color, but forget that. <laughs> um, the the bill shape is different. Uh, it's like a very much wedge-shaped bill on the ready turnstone. It comes to a very, very fine point. And the, so the, the turnstone goes sort of hunching around, probing and poking at things. And the, uh, the sanderling with its, its longer bill with more of a blunt tip, it runs around and, and picks its stuff at the surface. Um, but yeah, definitely worth comparing those two. Okay, and are shorebirds common at Malheur in the fall? Um, so yeah, I you know, <laughs> I, I'm not the best person to answer that, but uh, in my uh, limited experience, uh, yes, they can be. They they're very sensitive to water levels, but uh, if there are areas of the refuge where there's very shallow water and some muddy flats at the edge, then um, sometimes you can find really good numbers. And uh, looking at the, the eBird records uh, from the refuge, uh, it looks as if, you know, frequently there, there are lots of shorebirds there and good variety. Yeah, and we have confirmation here from the um, Portland Audubon biologist that helps to conduct the shorebird surveys that yes, um, they, they are. Okay, great. What else? Um, I saw a Pacific golden plover on the Oregon coast yesterday. It was a challenge to distinguish from the more common black bellied plover. Any comments on telling them apart, probably specifically at this time of year? Um, yeah, and you know, it's interesting. Black bellied plover and golden plover, they can be very, very similar in their overall uh, color patterns. Um, the um, Really, the shape and structure are the uh, the most useful things. Uh, the when they're when they're landing when when, when they take off, uh, the flight pattern is quite different because the uh, black-bellied plover has a big white wing stripe and white rump and uh, black under the, uh, the wing pits, where the upper side of the wings are more uniform on the golden plovers. Uh, but when they're not flying, uh, the the golden plover is a much more a delicate looking or elegant bird. It's got a slimmer neck, a slimmer body, longer wings, uh, somewhat longer legs. Uh, black, belly, black belly plovers are beautiful too, but they're, they, they tend to be more of a stocky, uh, you know, solid looking bird. And um, I, I have to study them again every year and just sort of get those shape differences fixed in my mind. Um, right. But that's, uh, that's where I'd start. Okay, someone is asking if stooping versus tipping feeding styles are a helpful ID. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, I, I might not be, uh, I might not be defining that in quite the same way, you know, but, but yeah, the, the feeding behavior, the tipping up, um, the, the, uh, uh, the way the way birds will the way shorebirds will go for stuff um, like tipping forward to pick at something versus uh, probing straight down versus the kind of action that you know long billed curlew even though it's a very long billed bird sometimes it just walks around and you know just just reaches out with the tip of the bill and picks up something that's like you know half a half a yard away um, but the um, yeah, the, the actions, the postures, and so on uh, are, are definitely a big part of identifying the birds. 
Awesome. And I think we have a final question. Lots of accolades and appreciation. Um, but someone did ask, are there any good ID characteristics for peeps on their heads, like an eyebrow stripe or something like that? Um, yeah, for, um, for it, it's, uh, it's always worth studying the, um, the head patterns and face patterns on, on the peeps. And for when you get into really, really detailed ID, uh, often it becomes really useful. And, um, you know, the, the examples that come to mind are really obscure ones, like long, uh, long-toed stint is an Asian bird that shows up very rarely uh, in North America. It's very similar to least sandpiper, but some of the best marks for telling them apart uh, involve the face pattern, the, the amount of light in front of the eye and the, uh, the eyebrow and whether it splits. Um, and so if you're, if you're going for the graduate level um, shorebird ID and you want to look for really rare species, then it really pays to uh, study the face patterns on these things closely. Um, and that, you know, that's another advantage of getting to a place where you can get very close looks. Because um, there, there will be differences between um, um, even, you know, semi-palmated and western sandpipers and the amount of pale area above the top of the bill. Um, but those tend to be uh, things you get into um, when you really know the common ones extremely well and you're starting to move on to try and figure out the excruciatingly difficult rare ones. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ken. This has been another great presentation. I do just want to plug before we say goodbye that tonight is going to be Malheur Trivia at 7 p.m. If you and a friend or two are interested in getting together to answer some questions about Malheur, um, winning a bumper sticker, and um, all of that, you can still sign up. All you have to do is sign up through the registration links that are on our website, as you can see the website URL here, but also there's a direct link from our homepage to get to the post that has all the reg links on it. Tomorrow is the auction at 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. If you attended a previous presentation, you may have heard me say it was at 7 p.m. I was mistaken and I am sorry, um, but a little bit earlier in the day will be a nice um, break for the afternoon. So please join us. We've got some great items that have been donated by businesses like the Narrows, the French Glen Hotel, Ord's Gallery, Portland Audubon, Steens Mountain Brewing. Um, there's going to be a whole series of um, five different Kaufman field guides up for bid and some feeders from Wild Birds Unlimited. A couple examples like here are the series of field guides and then what we're really excited about is this Gateway to the Steams set from a gift certificate from the Narrows, Steams Mountain Brewing, and the French Glen Hotel, the total value of $150 on those gift certificates. So um, tune in tomorrow afternoon and, and bid on those. Really pumped about that. Um, so without further ado, you know, these presentations and this whole week has been an amazing opportunity to connect with so many of you and to share what's happening out on Malheur. Um, thank you for supporting the refuge through the Friends Group and being a part of our community. You can always reach me at friends at malheurfriends.org or visit our website and check out our newsletter, which comes out every month. Thank you so much.